Hello everyone, um, we're going to do some more uh, work on fiduciary duty in tonight's lecture and we're going to be focusing on Friedman and uh, Boatwright. Um, if you remember uh, when we did Hasnas, I kind of was saying that Hasnas is, uh, this is on earlier this week on Monday's lecture, Monday night's lecture, Hasnas is not so much arguing for a particular position. Like he, he drops in his kind of opinions here and there and offers what he thinks would be like a good argument. Um, and he has that little section toward the end of the paper where he's emphasizing the morality of respecting consensual agreements. Um, that that is like a sort of like a basic moral value that we can use as a guide for sorting out this issue about moral and ethical responsibilities of managers. Like what should they be thinking about when they're making decisions about running the business? Um, but uh, with the readings we've got for tonight with Friedman and Boatwright, we're going to see more sustained arguments for certain positions in this debate. And Friedman's going to be defending stockholder theory. And Boatwright isn't, is, I mean, he, his main objective is kind of uh, critiquing stockholder theory. But um, you could definitely read him as, I, I think he probably fits most closely in with the stakeholder theory. Um, he mentions social contract theory in the article, but only as an actual possibility for how um, a stockholder theory might try to justify itself. So um, Boatwright is kind of uh, every, he's going to kind of represent the non-stockholder theory option. Um, so he's mainly defending the sphere of social responsibilities, but in a kind of weird way. And we'll, we'll talk about that. And we'll see how that works tonight. Um, but we are going to be getting into more sustained um, arguments that are sort of evaluating the different possible positions uh, on this issue. Um, my apologies for the weird way in which this video is going to look on YouTube. Um, I was trying to jury mander a way that people in the chat could get video from me and it could still show up um, uh, in the recorded video. So it looks a little weird, but Skype actually has does not have the ability to solve this problem. I did some research from uh, Monday's lecture and uh, Skype has, uh, this problem has been around since September. <laughs> people aren't happy about it, but they don't have a solution. So. We'll see. Maybe they'll fix it at some point. But uh, so far, it looks like there isn't a more workable solution. But I think this this will work fine. You can see my lecture notes. You can see my face. And you can hear my voice. So I think that'll be pretty good. All right. Before I get into Friedman, we'll do Friedman first. Uh, I did have a, a kind of – I read through the um, discussion board posts with the reading comment assignments where you posted uh, comments and, and questions you had. And I had a couple things I wanted to say about it. One is more just procedural, and the other one is more philosophical. So the procedural thing is just a reminder that for the for the reading comment assignments, when you're posting um, your three comments and questions on the discussion board, to just to kind of really be clear about it, this is um, these three questions or comments, and you can do more than three if you want to. You don't have to stick to that, but a couple of people did longer entries, and that's okay. Um, but they are supposed to be about what's happening for you. So doing things like summarizing the ideas from the text is not really what this is about. This is more about like your experience with the text, uh, what's happening on sort of your end of that encounter, um, rather than what's happening on the text end of that, that encounter. Um, so what you think of these ideas um, and what things you're, you've got questions about, what you might be confused about, things like that. Um, on the more philosophical end of this, though, uh, I was seeing a lot of posts that we're talking about um, sort of looking at this discussion between stockholder theory, stakeholder theory, and social contract theory in terms of a kind of um, practical, in terms of practical considerations. And I really, I want to clarify something. I was trying to emphasize this with um, Hasnas on Monday, um, but I'm going to definitely emphasize this again with Friedman. Um, all of these theories are ethical theories. They're not practical theories of business management. Um, and there, there's connections with this. Practical considerations can be normative. They are action guiding, right? Um, but it's not like we're going to decide on what are the ethical responsibilities of managers based solely on what's convenient for business practice or on how things just actually happen. Um, ethics is about how they should happen, not about how they do happen. And I really wanted to emphasize that. Also, um, by bringing it more directly into the sphere of circumstances and scenarios that will actually happen in the business world, 
that doesn't mean that this is any less abstract. And like I talked about on Monday night, um, you know, what's happening here is these um, models for business ethics, like these sort of policies or suggestions about what is the ethical way to be a manager, like in the fiduciary duty debate, um, they ultimately need and rely on their justification from more general abstract moral theories like utilitarianism, like Kant's deontic theory, like virtue ethics. Um, those are all things that um, these theories rely on for their justification. They can't be justified on the grounds that this is how people are already doing things. That doesn't work as an argument. Um, you can't derive an ought from an is. Uh, or two, that um, this is what is a practical solution. And I, so I want to say a little bit more about that, too. This is a theme that's going to show up even more strongly with our next topic, whistleblowing. But doing the right thing, living a moral life, acting ethically, is not always convenient. And that's true for individual people's lives, and it's also true for the life of a business. Like, what would be... Um, maybe what a business needs to do to survive in the marketplace um, or what it needs to do in order to generate more profit, uh, what would be conducive to those sorts of uh, practical goals uh, is not a guideline for what is ethical conduct. And that's why you don't see any arguments like that, even from people like Friedman who are defending the stockholder theory. In fact, uh, part of why, you know, Hasnas was complaining about how stockholder theory gets a bad name, part of it is because Many ethicists believe or, or kind of take this attitude about stockholder theory that it's really just an ethical rationalization for people to not be concerned about ethical matters, like things of actual ethical and moral significance. That's why if stockholder theory is, one, an ethical theory, it's talking about what is just. It's not just saying, oh, you don't have to be concerned about social responsibilities. You don't have to worry about that. That's not a big deal. It's having to say something like, you can't be concerned about social responsibilities because if you did, you'd be violating, you'd be doing something unjust. You would be doing something immoral. That's, and so the arguments are going to be moral arguments on behalf of stockholder theory. So just because something is going to be expedient or uh, practical or convenient um, for practical matters doesn't justify anything when it comes to ethics and morality. And I, I think that's a really important point, and I, I wanted to emphasize that. And if if some of you, uh, especially those of you who are making comments um, sort of in that vein or in that sort of mindset, uh, if you want to talk about that more with me, I would be really happy to. This is the kind of thing that um, always makes me sad that we don't have like a classroom where we can like talk and have rapport and go back and forth on this stuff, because that's, I think, a pretty important issue for discussion. Um, and it's also not, I, I'm not saying anything particularly controversial here. This is, this is kind of the world of morality. Now, I can say a little bit more um, to maybe help connect some dots. Like I said a second ago, what we would call practical considerations are action guiding. They speak to issues of value, right? But think about what's going on if we say the only thing that's going to direct our practical conduct is um, what can maximize profits and nothing more. If there isn't some other story here, like what Boatwright's going to ask, like what's so special about stockholders, um, or why, like what's the context for why profit profit maximizing might be the morally required thing to do. Um, if we just look at it as profit maximizing, then this really looks just morally insensitive. That there's a lot more to life and value than just increasing profits for certain people at maybe the expense of others. I mean, that that w does start to look more like an amoral situation. There are a lot of other values at stake here. Um, this is why there's a kind of big burden of proof for stockholder theory about why uh, the moral considerations need to be only about this and nothing uh, nothing else. Um, that is, uh, that's a hard sell when you're talking about all of the things that we could consider as potentially morally relevant. Um, so, um, I just want to emphasize, like, there's, there's a really strong, um, there's, a, there's a big need for a moral argument to defend a position like that. On its own, even though maybe a lot of people think this way about it, I mean, someone posted that they think stockholder theory has won, 
in today's world. I don't think that's true. Um, it certainly hasn't happened in the discussions among uh, people who think about ethics and think about business ethics and write about this. Um, and there's definitely plenty of examples of companies and business people who don't see the stockholder view as the correct view for how to think about their ethical responsibilities as managers. Um, there's a lot of counterexamples to that. But no matter how many people did, like even if the culture of business was completely this kind of uh, jungle dog-eat-dog world of uh, competition for personal enrichment, um, that wouldn't change anything about the sort of arguments in favor of one of these ethical visions over another. Because ethics is not about what is happening um, or fitting in with the society or something like that, but about universal values. Um, values about how things ought to be done. Um, and if that's not what's happening, then what the moral theory does is condemn the current practice. And that's a very viable possibility, right? No matter what was going on or what moral, you, moral theory you prefer or, or agree with or something like that, the possibility that the world may not be working the way it ought to is always a logical space that's open that needs to be considered. So practice and precedent um, doesn't determine those things. Um, think, uh, think like if you're living in Nazi Germany, the fact that everyone is sort of having this sort of worldview or has a vision for how society ought to be that it's only for these Aryan pure blood sorts of things and everyone else should be gassed and killed, that wouldn't make it right <laughs> to go along with that, right? Uh, it wouldn't matter how many other people share that view or how much personal risk you would have for uh, speaking up about it or resisting it or something. That doesn't make it any more right. And um, I know it's too easy to kind of look at the Nazis, but when we're talking about a basic issue about how to conceptually approach these matters. I think the um, example, I think that case example is appropriate and relevant. Um, so I wanted to say those things. If, if there's more discussion you want to have about that, um, I'd be happy to. If there's more uh, argument or justification for this that you want to hear from me about, like, why is, why is it that ethics works this way? Um, why is the practical mindset uh, insufficient um, to defend a position in this debate? I'd be happy to talk about that more. Look me up. Always down. Okay. So with that context in mind, let's look at Friedman and what he has to say for stockholder theory. Um, again, I, I think Friedman's a sincere moralist. I think he's trying to do what's right. Personally, I don't agree with stockholder theory. I mean, I'll just put those cards on the table. I don't personally agree with it. Um, but I do think he's sincere. He's not offering some rationalizing for greed or something like that. This isn't a like greed is good, Gordon Gecko kind of situation. That's not what Friedman's arguing for. In fact, you'll see him throw down some pretty heavy moral cards here as a, a, and appealing to some, some pretty serious moral values as a part of trying to justify this uh, position of stockholder theory. Um, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time reminding, uh, refreshing on stockholder theory. I mean, the basic position is pretty easily defined, that when a manager is thinking about what ethical obligations are they subject to in making decisions about how to run the business? They only have one responsibility um, to run the business um, in accordance with the purposes um, that the businesses were create, created based on the interests of the stockholders. Usually that means, especially when we're talking about stockholders here, uh, maximizing profits. So that's the only moral imperative that they have. And again, it isn't profit maximizing for its own sake. The only reason why profit maximizing is the directive given to managers under stockholder theory is because they are in this fiduciary relationship with the stockholders. Um, I was talking with some of my students on the on-campus class today. We, we had our session this afternoon and um, they were asking like, what if the stockholders told the manager to do something like that we might think of as scandalous and unethical, like dump a bunch of toxins into the local water supply. Uh, let's imagine that there isn't a law against that, so it's not illegal. Um, and the stockholders like want um, the manager to do that because uh, they are worried about the cut to their profits if they had to dispose of this stuff in a way that was more environmentally friendly. There's going to be at risk. There's going to be a risk for the people in the area, et cetera, et cetera. And the answer that stockholder theory gives is 
is really, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating here. It's saying the manager has an obligation to dump the toxins and doing anything else would be unethical and immoral for the manager to do. Why? Because they are an agent of the stockholders. They're just an extension of the stockholders' will. If you want to say some moral wrongdoing was done, yeah, there it was. But that's on the stockholders and their wishes. It's not on the manager. The manager didn't do anything unethical. They're really they're kind of like the servant of the stockholders. They have to act in the interests of the stockholders and follow their kinds of wishes. Um, now, it, it might take, we have to imagine some pretty, uh, oh, now the uh, video thing that I set up is, let me fix it. Oop. Yeah, as more participants will come in, my my little jury, gerrymandered setup won't work. I'll fix it. Um, hey, Liling, welcome. Okay, there we go. Um, it would be, you'd be hard pressed to maybe find some stockholders who wouldn't have any problems with dumping a bunch of toxins into a water supply um, it, under the situation in which it wasn't illegal. But if they did, and I can probably imagine some people who would be okay with that for the sake of making profit, the manager has to follow their wishes. They're just, in, they're just an extension of the will of the stockholders. That's how stockholder theory sees it. And because of that duty being so primary and so necessary, um, there isn't room for any other ethical considerations like how would this harm people in the community or something like that. Stockholder theory is saying there's an exclusive duty to the stockholders. And for that reason, there's no room for any other moral considerations to get on the, on the radar for the manager's decision making. Okay. So, uh, and Friedman would probably say, this is kind of skipping ahead a little bit, but Friedman would say, if you don't like the situation where the company is putting these toxins in the local drinking water, um, then uh, go talk to your representative, like get the government involved. That's what the government is for, to set regulations for the businesses. That's not something that's, um, that the manager needs to be taking up or taking the initiative on or something like that. In fact, if they did that, they'd be doing something unethical according to stockholder theory. So that's, that's the position again really quickly. I want to dive into the arguments. Okay, so there's we got to be careful with Friedman a little bit. Uh, he, you're not going to see many, uh, I don't think you will see another writer this quarter uh, who's going to quite have Friedman's, uh, let's say, level of enthusiastic rhetoric. <laughs> uh, he's pretty loaded rhetorically, but we got to be careful about that. Um, rhetoric can make something sound more persuasive than it actually is based on its ideas and its arguments. So there's certain metaphors and images that Friedman brings up that uh, we have to unpack to see what their argument is. And a couple of these things show up right away. So he says, to fulfill a social responsibility, a manager would have to be spending other people's money, basically without their consent. And he describes this as imposing taxes and deciding how to spend them. Um, and that doesn't get cashed out directly. Uh, we are going to get this political argument in a second that will help with cashing that out. But I think um, Friedman, when he's kind of throwing some of this rhetorical language around, I think he's just trying to appeal to an intuition that this is unfair, um, that it, and it's unjust to uh, basically force people to do things that they haven't consented, especially with the things that they own, right? And the idea here is stockholders own the company. Um, there's actually a lot of subtlety to all of this um, that Boatwright's going to help us think about because. The idea of agency or surrogate, like the surrogate decision making we talked about last time, um, ownership is another one here, um, contracts, all these moral metaphors and models are sort of floating around stockholder theory and how it tries to defend itself most of the time. And um, Boatwright's going to help us think about them and be like, actually, those are all kind of like different arguments. So we have to kind of look at them one by one in detail. So we'll, we'll see that happen when we get to Boatwright. But Friedman's just kind of toss them all around here. So... Um, we'll, we'll talk about those details when we get to vote right. But the first major argument, there's kind of two, two arguments here. I labeled them as principle and consequences because they're appealing to different types of values here. Um, the political argument is basically one about authority and legitimacy for certain um, decision making. So Friedman's sort of thinking, actually, I think this is helpful for understanding Friedman's point of view. Everyone in the business ethics world or anyone who talks about fiduciary duty 
would say that managers have a moral obligation to not engage in embezzlement, right? So if like a CEO or something is taking company resources and just putting them in their pocket for personal enrichment, that's totally unethical. Now, the different theories are going to say different things about why that's unethical. Um, but for the stockholder theory, the reason that it's unethical is that the manager is using company resources for purposes that the stockholders are not intending, right? Their personal enrichment, other than the paycheck that they get, of course. But if they're doing, if they're going outside of that, then they're using resources for some, for, not for a purpose. They're taking away from the profits of the stockholders when they embezzle. Friedman thinks that exerting social responsibility is basically morally equivalent to embezzling. You're spending someone else's money in a way that they did not consent to, for a purpose they didn't consent to. Now, embezzling, if I'm the one embezzling, I'm personally enriching myself. But Friedman would say, it doesn't matter where the money is going. The problem is that you're stealing it from the stockholders. Um, stealing here may be in air quotes a little bit. Um, if I'm exerting social responsibility, I'm taking the stockholders' money and giving it someplace else. I'm putting it to some other sort of work, okay? Um, like putting it in my pocket. Those are basically the same. So Friedman sort of thinks of social, uh, socially responsible managers as kind of like Robin Hood. And what did Robin Hood do? Steal from the rich to give to the poor. It doesn't matter if it's benevolent. It doesn't matter if it has altruistic motives to it. Friedman thinks this is an unjust act on the part of the manager. Now, Friedman is all for it, and actually he says this in other places too, that he thinks, um, does the manager or CEO have a moral responsibility to contribute to society? Yes. Do stockholders have a responsibility to do this? Yes. But um, for the manager, if they want to care about society, let them spend their own money, Friedman says. stockholders If stockholders don't want to, if they should spend their money to maybe help society. If they don't, well, that's on them. That's their problem. But again, like I was describing with the doc, uh, dumping toxins into the water supply, it's not the manager's job to interfere with that. That's not their rightful domain, that sort of thing. And so here's where the political argument comes up. If the manager does do that, then um, Friedman sort of describes it as a second taxation. I think Hasnas kind of used that, that metaphor too, that they're imposing a tax on the stockholders money their investment um, and then they spend them too and he and Friedman says that is a political activity and if it's justified it has to be held accountable to the standards of politics of, of government this is what the government does it takes money from people and uses it for purposes that doesn't uh, that's outside of what individual citizens give their consent to um, and I'm not uh, uh, forgetting about democracy here but in a representational democracy, a democratic republic, um, the government does not ask for your consent about your money. Uh, it gives you another way of having a voice in these proceedings. And Friedman thinks that's pretty important. Um, he, he quotes this line here about no taxation without representation, right? Then we think to exert this political function without representation is a problem. And when a manager is exerting social responsibilities, they're basically taking on the mantle of the government when they do that, kind of being a social engineer. And uh, no one gets a say in that. Society, there's no democratic feedback about how the manager should be doing this sort of thing. And I think you can actually find some examples of people in our contemporary world um, who are not uh, managers as much as maybe, well, some of them are kind of CEOs. Some are just owners, though, people who like straight up own companies and use those companies to try to work some social vision um, for I, this happens on the conservative side and on the liberal side of the political spectrum. And Friedman's worried about that. He doesn't think that's appropriate. He thinks that there's a limit to um, like what it means to be able to do what you want with your money. It doesn't. Um, well, I guess he'd, he'd probably be fine with people doing whatever they want with their money. Um, like if they want to donate into some social project or something like that, he's probably okay with that. But for the manager to do it, to exert a political function of taking other people's money and deciding where it would go, he thinks it would need to be subject to be legitimate. It'd have to be subject to the 
uh, conditions for the legitimacy of a government, which requires this representation. It requires this democratic integration with the rest of society. Um, so there's no oversight when the manager does this, and they're not elected to bear this responsibility. So it's not so much like, um, you'd be like, well, why can't they help people? And Friedman would say, because they don't have the mandate or authority to do so politically. That's his argument here. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that's the first argument. This is an argument in principle. Here's another argument, though. This one, this one goes in a little different direction. Oh, and I'm going to have to fix my video again. Okay, here we go. Let's make that. Can I get this a little bigger? Eh. Eh. Hmm. Now it's really small. Okay. I will try to do my best. Okay. Um, so now we got this uh, second type of argument that Friedman offers, and this one is actually consequentialist. Um, it's more like utilitarianism. It's about harm and benefit and this sort of thing. Like this is on principle, right, of what would be a just political system. And to have uh, managers of corporations as social engineers, thinks uh, he thinks is violating that principle of a just government. Um, just uh, political mechanisms. Okay, but this argument is going to be consequentialist, the market argument. And here, um, th this should sound a little familiar from Hasnas. Hasnas was actually saying that this argument, he thinks, is not a very good one for the stockholder theorist to lean on. Um, but we'll we'll see. There's a couple, there might be a couple points Friedman makes that survives the worries Hasnas has and that he thinks a lot of contemporary uh, ethicists and economists have. Um, but just as a reminder, the, the thing that's sort of fallen out of favor is this idea that of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Um, and that's really what Friedman's talking about here when he's talking about political mechanisms supplanting market mechanisms and allocating resources. So if you, if you do have managers exerting social responsibility, um, performing this kind of political function, then that would be to commit to a kind of political position that he thinks is inappropriate. Um, it's, and here's a quick note. It's really hard to separate the politics from the business ethics when it comes to Friedman. For him, they're really like deeply entwined. The kinds of values that are relevant for proper government um, are going to be connected with the values for proper ethical practice in the business world. Friedman's writing in the 80s here. Um, there's a lot of like post-Cold War, War stuff. I mean, he he uses the dirty S word as a dirty S word. <laughs> Socialism is uh, considered by Friedman, you know, as like, well, we don't want to be socialists because those commies are out there, that kind of thing. Um, so there, there's definitely some prejudice here against socialism and communism. But keep in mind, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that Friedman is biased because of his time period. I'm just saying that people in this time period are deeply thinking about um, val social values that have to do with the economy as like directly linked with political values. So like um, in the post code, in the Cold War and post Cold War world, like capitalism and democracy go like hand in hand. Um, people who are advocating Western democracies are thinking capitalism is the way that you protect those values. Communism threatens capitalism and so it threatens democratic values. The fact that the USSR is kind of authoritarian doesn't help matters very much um, for making that association. Um, but even in when we're not in a Cold War situation where people are paranoid about communism and you find more people today who are willing to entertain the kind of ethical and moral arguments of Marx and, and of socialism and communism. We'll talk more about this later on this, this quarter. In fact, probably one of the most premier Western world, Western democracy uh, thinkers on social justice is like all for socialism. So we'll talk about that too. Um, but uh, there, all of that acknowledged, all that kind of cultural setting and stuff, that is, I'm not saying to dismiss Friedman or look less on his arguments because of that. People in this time period are looking at things a certain way, but there might be a logic to that. And, I, and I'm saying this as someone who doesn't agree with Friedman and is not a stockholder theorist. But if you want to understand what he's doing charitably, 
there are some plausible grounds for seeing there seeing there to be a connection between what's going on with uh, the values that inform our politics and the values that inform our economics. Okay, so that's what's happening here. He thinks there's a question here about what's the best way to make a just society. Should you have political mechanisms like regulations and things like this um, sh sort of shaping the way the economy works uh, how resources get distributed in society or should you have market mechanisms do this have the free market do it and Friedman definitely has this kind of Adam Smith uh, thing going on where um, he thinks here I'll, I'll, let's get down to this point right here this is a direct connection Freeman thinks when artificial political means are used to enforce social welfare, more problems result. So if you've got heavy regulation, big government, this kind of thing, uh, should still sound familiar. Republicans still argue this way all the time, um, and definitely libertarians, um, that uh, big government is inefficient. It doesn't do a good job of allocating resources in the most effective way. We don't get the most bang for our buck with our resources if you've got big government political mechanisms sort of running the show. But if you let it just be a free market, unregulated or minimally regulated, um, as minimally as possible, that's going to create the most good for society. You're going to have the most efficient use of resources. There's going to be the most bang for your buck in terms of what we can do in our economy uh, for, for increasing value, right? This isn't just a matter of dollars and cents, too. This is a matter of, like, how do you take a resource and make something valuable out of it? And that value might not be measured in terms of money. It might be valued in terms of utility, for example, which is a more abstract concept. That's what Hasnas, that kind of logic, Hasnas is saying, yeah, that's looking less and less plausible. So since Friedman's time, um, the sort of thought and thinking and, and modeling um, and kind of learning from history that economists have been doing is showing, yeah, that doesn't seem to happen. That invisible hand force is not strongly present. And the strongest case that the kind of free market capitalists can make here is that market me mechanisms, letting the free market set prices based on supply and demand and all that sort of stuff, um, does maybe uh, increase efficiency of markets in terms of like gross nat um, gross national um, product things like that um, like overall efficiency for the market is increased but what you also see are huge things like are like um, factors like um, massive inequality of wealth and income and things like that so it doesn't always mean maximizing utility it doesn't always mean maximizing the good consequences for people in their lives um, so there's there's a lot more questions about that um, that happen in economics these days. So in terms of making a consequentialist argument that market mechanisms can do a better job of allocating resources and political mechanisms, that's looked on with a lot of skepticism these days. Uh, and it's not as plausible or intuitive as it was in Milton Friedman's day when he wrote this paper. But I think Friedman still has some arguments that survive those sorts of concerns, especially this one. This one, I think, gets around that problem. So if we like skipping back for a second here to the political argument Friedman's saying managers do not have the authority or the legitimacy to perform this function that's the argument there here he's saying and they're incompetent at it <laughs> he's saying if you're looking at people who are good business people they're not necessarily going to be the best people for deciding what's going to be a uh, good social policy um, or they're, they're not going to be the most effective social engineers let's say um, you would probably need to get some other people who are specialized in that. Like uh, business people, you couldn't plug them right in as uh, policy makers in government. They don't have that kind of expertise. They don't, uh, he, he just says they don't have the wisdom, but you can treat wisdom as code for understanding all the sorts of um, non-financial um, non factors that policy decisions have. Uh, that is exactly what... Um, like uh, policy policy nuts in Washington are good at, and they're they are doing a lot of research to inform that. Now, someone actually um, uh, said in my class this afternoon, they were like, "Well, what if a company just hired those people?" So the company was like, "Oh yeah, we have uh, 
uh, we see ourselves as having social responsibilities that we're responsible for, um, and that needs to inform the business. And so to get around Friedman's problem, we'll just hire a staff. Um, maybe we'll even have like a co-CEO uh, or a vice president or something who brings that expertise to the table and can help to inform the business person who's the manager of the company on how those factors would influence things, like if you had a stakeholder theory or something like that. But this is, I mean, that that might be a solution. I don't know. I, I have to think a little bit more about that. That was just a suggestion a student from earlier gave. Um, but this does seem to be a little bit of a concern. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, the probably the person I hear the most about here is Elon Musk. He's got like a vision for humanity and stuff and is thinking about values that are bigger than just bottom line. Although he definitely cares about the bottom line, I can tell you that much. Um, but I'm not, I don't actually, I mean, I've listened to Elon Musk speak. Uh, I've kind of got a sense for what his vision is i'm not all that confident he has a he, he's the right guy for this kind of job like if he was running for government office i'm, I'm not so sure about that um uh leeling what are you wondering about leeling asked what about the bottom line uh what do you mean Oh, um, the bottom line meaning maximizing profits. It's a reference to like the bottom line of a ledger. So like your net profit. Okay, so um, Friedman thinks um, telling managers that they don't just have a fiduciary duty to the stockholders to maximize profits. If you let them start playing around with other social responsibilities that's actually not in the best interest of society that's the that's the main point of this second line of attack okay um and i, I think this is then i say here there's sort of a last argument um and i think this is really his major platform and again you're going to see the sort of political values mixing with the um business ethic values um and it's this kind of idea. Friedman is really worried about the circumventing of democracy and the undermining of free society. So this, this point kind of goes back to the political argument. Um, Friedman is worried that by giving managers uh, the freedom to engage in social responsibilities, that you are basically saying to them, look, you can sidestep the government. Um, not only uh, do you not, uh, Friedman saying, not only do you not have the legitimacy and the authority to engage in these actions, by exerting social responsibilities, you actually undermine the government's authority to do that, right? You're kind of, um, not only are you subject to the laws of accountability that governments have through democracy, but by doing this on top, it's not, it's not like a plus if more people are engaged in social responsibility, Friedman's thinking, because this undermines um, the authority that the government has to do this. So he's thinking uh, managers might think, well, hey, okay, I want to see society go in this direction. If I can't convince my fellow citizens to vote for it and win in the, in the sort of arena of democracy, then I'll just unilaterally make the decision in how I run this company. So I describe it as uh, being a social vigilante. Um, this is my word. This is not Friedman's word, but it's kind of like being Batman, right? What does Batman do? Well, he's like, uh, justice needs to be served, and I don't trust the legal system for it, so I'm going to go do my brand of vigilante justice that's outside of the law. Like, Batman doesn't engage in uh, due process when he goes and beats up some thugs, right? That's not his... That's not what he's doing. In the same way, Friedman would say, uh, a manager exerting social responsibilities is stepping outside of the sort of the boundaries of legitimacy of democracy in order to get their social vision out there, right? To exert this kind of change on the world. That's how Friedman's looking at it. I think this is challengeable. Like whether he's framing and casting the situation accurately um, with social responsibilities that is a question. I don't think that this is uh, sort of obvious. Um, there's other ways to, to look at what's happening here, but, but this is how he does it. Okay, so um, the, he 
he also is bringing something new to the table here with this final argument. So this is, like I said, it's really getting into a political argument. He is all for small government. He's opposed to big government. He thinks the more that a government is regulating the markets, the more the market system is undermined. And what it sort of also undermines is people's liberty to engage in actions as they choose. And he's got a kind of some reasons for this. One, he says a lack of compulsion, um, not having a government regulation, makes it harder to coerce or control for good or for bad purposes. So um, it's sort of, it, it, he's kind of picking a poison here. I think that's the right, right way to frame it. This is a classic debate in politics, especially American politics. If you don't have major regulations, then the business world becomes like whatever, right? People can be dumping toxins into the water stream, et cetera, et cetera. So you're kind of uh, making your bed in, in the area of people's individual choices and what they're going to do. On the other one, though, the other, pick, the other poison you can pick is to have the government try to regulate everything and set up a system in society that's, where it's really getting its fingers into everything. And that might be, that can backfire because once you give the government the authority to do that, they could also use that same power in ways that are unjust, right? So they, the a big government could be used to oppress people um, if it's not, you know, working toward public good anymore. Um, that's a concern. Now, I think there's arguments to be said on both sides here, but Friedman's defending the side about um, it'd be better to have less coercion as a part of our society. And that's what happens once you put the law in place, right? Uh, the law sets a mandate that then needs to be enforced by the power of the government, like through the cops and things like that. Sentencing prisons, that whole system. Okay, so that's the point he's trying to make. I do think there are arguments on the other side too. Um, that, you know, well, well, we'll get to some more of this stuff with Boatwright actually. Okay, um, and this is sort of interesting. He says, um, while this might just be this might begin as just an exercise of conscience by managers, so it's kind of like them using their freedom. They use their freedom in a way that leads to a result where the government uh, takes control of everything and they lose their freedom. So that's why he calls it suicidal. So it's sort of like when managers are like welcoming the government to start regulating. If they're like, yeah, we I don't want to be a social vigilante. I'm in the business world. I see these bad things happening. They need to be regulated. Um, I'm happy to endorse um, government policies and, and representatives and laws that are going to put more regulate, regulatory oversight on what's happening in the market. Um, uh, Friedman thinks they're giving up their liberty freely. That's how he looks at it. Again, also controversial, can be argued with. Um, <clears throat> but he's, he's sort of seeing the free market as a moral ideal that protects this idea of freedom, a value of freedom, um, actions of uncoerced consent. And as soon as you start having social responsibility or government regulations, it's undermining that ideal because it's allowing use of resources of what people own uh, for reasons that they are not consenting to. And that's a problem. Friedman does grant, like I say here, um, that some of this is required to have a functioning society. This is a kind of principle of conformity. When you have laws that are enforced by the cops, you're forcing conformity onto people. Um, and Friedman is happy to grant that this can't be anarchy. Uh, anarchism is not Friedman's position. Some people argue for anarchy uh, as, a, as the most ideal form of government. Um, Friedman's not one of those people. He thinks, yeah, there's some things we should be on the same page about, like you can't murder people. You can't steal from them. Um, if those things, if we don't have conformity on those issues, then uh, the social fabric will tear apart and that's not gonna be good for anybody. All right, the chaos is gonna be destructive, harm, people's rights and freedoms will not be, their liberty will be at threat under anarchy. So you've got some, you need to have some degree of conformity of government regulations so that this isn't just a total shit show. Um, but he's sort of saying, make sure that that's as small as possible. If we can get away, if it's good enough to not have more of these regulations, then um, then we shouldn't have them. If we can do without them and still have a functioning society, then that's what we should go for in order to protect freedom. 
right? That's the big, big thing here. Um, it's a fair question to ask, where is that line drawn? What are the sorts of uh, lack of regulation or lack of conformity that we can get away with? When is an issue serious enough that it calls for action? Like, I'm guessing almost everyone in this class would be like, yeah, if there wasn't a law that forbid companies to just dump toxins into the local water supply that people use for drinking water, then there should be a law like that. There should be a law banning that um, and punishing any company that violates that regulation. Um, I'm pretty sure we're probably in agreement on that. But again, that's just one case example. Where do you draw the line on this? Uh, that is a uh, principled question that needs a principled answer. Uh, and we can't just deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we want, we'd want to have some continuity about that. So um, Tanya asks, does he think that it is all right not to have a regulation or law as long as one individual cannot affect freedom of another? Can you help me understand what you mean by that? Yeah, that's right. Um, Tanya's saying, uh, I say that he is trying to avoid regulations and rules as much as possible, but also doesn't want complete anarchy. That's right. Where is the middle ground? What's the breaking point for him? Yeah, I. he doesn't get into it in this article. I can sort of project things onto his position based on what I know of arguments offered by people who agree with this general viewpoint. Um, I would say... So like this is a common thing that you'll find lots of business ethicists and a lot of social justice people talking about that you want to um, you need to protect people's freedoms. We could say protect their human rights and human rights are basically setting up obligations that everyone else is subject to like uh, for you to have a right is one side of a coin where the other half is obligations for everybody else. So if I have a right to life everyone else is under an obligation not to kill me. That takes away your freedom, right? It's forcing a rule onto you. There's like a, every time you have an obligation, there's something that you are not allowed to do. And actually I should say, I think this is often misunderstood. Moral obligations don't take away freedoms. Um, you, you're still free to do a moral thing or an immoral thing, but that doesn't mean that because you're free to do it, any way in which you use your freedom is morally permissible. That's not true. But when we're talking about a law and the presence of coercive force on the part of the government to back up that law, now we're starting to talk about forces of conformity and freedom being taken away. Um, under the law, I don't have the freedom to kill people, um, and that can be cashed out in a very practical way. If I choose to do that, I can expect lots of negative consequences going my way. Right? I'm going to have to deal with a lot of crap from the government because they're like, you violated our laws and we're going to hold you accountable to that. All right? So every time you want to respect someone's rights, um, you want to give them positive freedom, that does mean putting restrictions on everybody else. There are going to be things that are sort of out of bounds, right? Um, you're imposing these rules. So you might think about like, what are the rules that we absolutely have to have in order to protect people's liberty, to carve out space for their freedom? Um, but no more than that. All right, we're not going to go further. And that's what you see out of people who are in kind of Friedman's end of the spectrum or on the libertarian end of the model. Um, they're more focused around uh, a moral theory or a business ethics theory that's upholding the value of freedom and liberty and putting, shining the spotlight on that, putting that at the top, um, than other values like well-being. Like these other things that would be social responsibilities oftentimes are sort of looked at from people on Friedman's side of this debate as happiness considerations. They're utility considerations. And that would be crossing a line for him. Friedman does not think we have, um, that there's a government mandate legally, that there should be some legal mandate to put laws in place that will be enforced by the government's power that tell people they have to be kind to each other or be compassionate or help each other out or something like that. 
He wants to protect freedoms like you get to do what you want with what you have, with what you own, things like that. There's certain things I can't do, right? Like I can't pay someone to kill you. That would, that would be, I'm not allowed to do that. I don't have that much freedom with my money, with my private property. <laughs> um, but again, Friedman's saying like as little as possible. Um, so it's mostly a matter of protecting a positive space for people's rights and freedoms, I think. I think that's going to be the principle that he's going to use. And other things that go beyond that, like increasing the quality of life for people um, or preventing harm um, or promoting happiness, those are not things that we're going to have um, regulations about. Now, we do have things like that because we don't have this kind of um, libertarian dream for how our political system works, where the regulations are like absolutely minimal. We've got a lot more like that. We have social programs. Medicaid, a uh, Medicare, um, there's a lot of things that fall in the category of welfare, um, not just um, food stamps and income assistance and things like that. Um, there's a lot of things that count as welfare. Um, basically, the government spending people's money, their taxes, for things that create public goods, like um, fire departments and streets and bridges and stuff like that, right? Um, those are all things that increase people's welfare. That's not a matter of protecting their freedom. Um, when it comes to some things, right? So this is where Friedman is kind of double dipping a little bit because he makes this market argument. He says it's actually, and this is kind of an argument like, oh, let me be clear. I'll slow, let me slow it down. So... Friedman, I think, is saying the core of the moral authority behind the fiduciary duty of managers to increase profits for the stockholders uh, does not come from a consequentialist argument. It comes from a deontic one. It comes from these principles about um, political authority and from respecting the autonomous choices, the, the non-coerced consensual agreements between people. Like, if the people who own a company want to use that company to increase their profits, they have a right to. And if they hire people to do that, they have a right to do that. And the people that they hire are bound by that duty to do the things that the stockholders want done with their money. To get in the way of that um, by either the initiative of the manager to exert social responsibility or externally from the government imposing regulations on to do the same thing, that gets in the way of respecting people's autonomy. It interferes with their ability to make free choices with each other, free transactions, that kind of thing. That's Friedman's main argument. That has nothing to do with utilitarianism, but everything about freedom. But then when he gets to the market argument, he is bringing in something that's kind of utilitarian. It's about consequences. Utilitarianism is a consequentialist theory. But I think maybe to see the dialectic framed like this, um, Friedman sort of saying, hey, and for those of you who care about social welfare, you don't have you shouldn't have any complaints with this like there's no there's nothing you can object to here because not only does this respect people's autonomy and freedom to have this stockholder theory of business ethics but it actually is the best way to promote the social good too so he's trying to kind of have it both ways um, but I definitely think if he uh, if Friedman sort of saw the contemporary arguments and was convinced by them that the Adam Smith invisible hand thing just isn't plausible it doesn't work that way uh, in the actual world, that's a kind of theoretical fantasy, and he gave up that argument, he wouldn't give up his whole position. He'd just be like, okay, that's fine. Let's go back to my main argument again, right? Um, so I, I kind of feel like the market argument is, is sort of a superfluous argument. It's not the main foundation that he's trying to stake his flag on. That's not the main foundation he's building his position on. So, so I don't think he's the... Um, He's not quite the opposite of utilitarianism, but he's also not sort of trying to ground this whole thing on a utilitarian argument. That's more of a secondary thing, I think. Does that make sense to you, Tanya? Cool. All right. Awesome. One last idea here. And I think this is really interesting. Remember me talking about this in Hasnas where... Um, like these stockholder theorists always like to put something in about honest business practice. But I was saying I'm pretty skeptical about this. And th this will be an important point when we get to vote right here as we make the transition to vote right. Remember again, stockholder theory 
it is making a pretty extreme claim. It's saying um, a manager has this fiduciary duty to the stockholders to maximize profits. Because of that duty, there is no room for anything else. Any other ethical considerations are not on the radar. Because if they were on the radar, that duty would get violated. So it's really hard to see any room to tack on any other ethical considerations other than to maximize profits. That's the mandate given to the manager and nothing more. I mean, you can put in the part about don't break the law, but that's just to respect the legitimate authority that a government can have in a democracy over its citizens. Okay, So the business is going to have to play by the law. But if you want to put anything else in there, like honest business practice, what's the justification for that on stockholder theory? There doesn't seem to be one. There doesn't seem to be any theoretical room for making that claim. You can't just like pin that on in an ad hoc sort of way. Um, and in fact, the main position seems to reject the possibility of doing anything else. And yet, stockholder theorists like to do this in here. And I, and I think this is important. I, I think this is a, a place to push a little bit. Maybe I should turn my hat a little bit for this one. But, I mean, here's the thing that's definitely true. Friedman is savvy to this. And that's why he starts speaking very carefully in this section of the paper. And he's like, okay. He sort of recognizes. I cannot say that managers have a moral responsibility to engage in non-deceptive practices with their fellow business people. Okay? If they can if they can do that and maximize profits, that's open. That's definitely an option they can take. And it might be the one they have to take if their responsibility is to maximize profits for their stockholders. Um, but he finds this unpalatable. He finds it distasteful. So he says, first of all, he's skeptical of altruistic intentions behind social responsibility in business anyway. I mean, Friedman sort of thinks all of these other people I hear talking about that people are in the world of business who are saying we should exert social responsibilities. Friedman's like, I'm, I don't believe you. I think you have ulterior motives. I think you're just interested in using a positive PR campaign in society as a long-term strategy for profit. This isn't really about social responsibilities. It's just code for another mechanism to get profit. But it's a sort of weird one, right? It's like business people posturing as if they don't care about profit in order to care about profit. Um, so that seems a little dishonest, right? And Friedman finds that distasteful. But he is unwilling to go so far to morally condemn this. And I think he's right to do that. He does not have a theoretical position that allows him to justify saying that's immoral conduct or it's unjust or it's violating some duty. Because the stockholder theory is saying the only duty is to increase profits. But Friedman very carefully says he does admire the disdain for such tactics as approaching fraud. So when he sees a business person who's like, yeah, I'm just not going to choose that. Friedman's like, my man. right? But that's it. He can't, he can't say anything more other than he just has a preference against this. Because if he wanted to say it was an ethical thing, he'd have to fit it into the other ethical claims that he's making, and there really isn't any logical or rational room for that. So I, what, I, what I find interesting about this is, you know, how, how could we explain this distaste Friedman has? Well, maybe something like virtue ethics from Aristotle, that uh, we like honest people, like they're, they're people we'd enjoy spending time with. I don't want one of these dishonest people as my friend, for example. Um, that wouldn't be good. I might want one of them as a manager of my business, but I wouldn't want them to be my friend. So maybe we just don't like them as people. They're shifty people. They're kind of um, slimy, right? Um, but they would make good managers. And and actually, ethical managers, according to stockholder theory, right? Um, but I might tell Friedman, if he was still alive and I was talking to him, I might be like, I, I've always wanted to ask him about this more and kind of poke at it a little bit and be like, why do you not treat that feeling or that preference as maybe alerting you to something that's morally relevant? Like, what would be the problem with that? And I think this little thread can unravel a little bit. Like, tugging at this thread might cause some things to unravel. Um, I think in some ways, even in a competitive business environment, there's sort of a level of cooperation that's required to make the whole game work. And that's one of the weird things about capitalism. It is a system of cooperation at the same time as being a system of intense competition. And I think that's really interesting. So there might actually be not a paradox for Friedman, but just a paradox for capital, for free market capitalism as an ethical ideal. Could be a problem with that. 
of saying like unregulated free market capitalism, that kind of thing. Um, that it has a kind of internal conflict, a, a contradiction with itself about its own values and its own vision. Um, so that's all. I'm not going to spend more time talking about that. But if that piques your interest or you want to talk about that more, um, we could do that sometime maybe outside of class um, or outside of lecture time. Okay. Um, so that is Friedman. Um, we've got a few people in the chat room tonight. Um, any questions from all of you about um, Friedman and what we've been talking about? Okay, good. Okay. And I think we should um, maybe take a little break and come back for boat right. So um, I will pause the video and step away for a sec. So with boat right, um, setting this up here, boat right's going to be on the kind of other end of this conversation. Um, in this paper, he's really challenging the logic uh, and moral argumentations behind uh, stockholder theory, and he's he's really useful even if you disagree with boat right. He's helpful for really breaking down uh, if you wanted to defend Friedman, like what is the sort of um, basket you want to put your eggs into and what are you up against? Like what kinds of uh, burden of proof do you have to shoulder? And this is a really good general principle for doing good philosophy. Like I've mentioned before, your opponent's your best friend. I mean, they really help inspire you to figure out what you need to talk about. And when you're working on maybe your presentation project for this class or eventually your paper, or even just with your journal entries, if you're like, I don't know what else to say, I don't know what else there, there is to say or what more I have to say about this, thinking about how your perspective can be challenged by arguments on the other side can oftentimes inspire you. Um, Leeling, you're wondering about uh, a comparing of Boatwright and Friedman, kind of like a, on a broad level. Yeah, okay. The, the first thing to say is Friedman is defending stockholder theory. Uh, Boatwright is um, challenging it. <laughs> he's, he doesn't think it makes sense. Um, and the big thing that he's attacking is the idea that the fiduciary duty that a manager has to the stockholders is this kind of exclusive duty which makes no room for any other ethical considerations. Okay, that's the... That's the main issue that Beltright has with stockholder theory. He's actually going to say some things at the end, like in sort of his final position, that is kind of reminiscent of some of Friedman's points, but it's going to be justified on a really different basis. And that really matters in morality. I mean, it changes the whole meaning of what we're doing. It's kind of similar to what I was talking about at the very beginning of this lecture when I was saying how, um, you know, the, the stockholder position might look like it's pretty compatible with something like <clears throat> making business decisions in a kind of amoral way just about seeking profit or like a kind of uh, Gordon Gecko greed is good kind of thing but it's really not um, even though it is sort of saying the only mandate that a manager has is to increase profits it's arguing for that on moral grounds not amoral grounds and that's what Hasnas was complaining about about how stockholder theory sometimes gets turned into a straw man and thrown under the bus because it's seen in that way as being really amoral and it's not amoral okay but Boatwright thinks it isn't the right moral view it does it's not picking up the stick from the right end um, Boatwright if I was going to categorize him I think he does um, go uh, more in the stakeholder position I think that's more natural to his position um, the final position he's going to offer. In some ways you could see um, him justifying this rejection of stockholder theory on social contract grounds, but I'll get into that. I think that's more of just a little aside that Boatwright goes on when he talks about social contracts rather than um, uh, a full-on endorsement of uh, social contract theory. I think stakeholder theory is the main thing because <clears throat> if you've read the paper you know his sort of final appeal is to public policy as the moral basis for deciding on the ethical responsibilities of managers. Li Ling, you're asking, if not seeking profit, what is the purpose for a company to exist? <clears throat> so 
there's a lot of ways I could answer that. Um, and I don't want to go on like a huge, huge tangent about my thinking about this. Um, I'm always happy to let my students know what my positions are, but like I've said before, this class is not about, it's not a class on Tim Lineman philosophy. It's, it's, I want this class to be informing you about ethical controversies and what are the possible positions and some of the basic arguments and sort of giving you the resources to be able to think about this for yourself more critically. But just from the theories that we have on the table, um, let's, social contract theory has the most direct answer to your question. If not seeking profit, what's the purpose of a company to exist? It exists, like you remember in social contract theory, it's basically saying um, society is willing to grant legitimacy to a business as a social institution for the purposes of increasing social welfare and protecting people's rights, considerations of justice. <clears throat> and as Hosnos kind of broke it down, there's a lot of plausible ground for seeing that a business is capable of performing those functions. Um, I, I think uh, stakeholder theory is also kind of thinking about um, the purpose of a business as having, I mean, the stakeholder theory would sort of say something like, yeah, it's for the sake of promoting, of generating profit, but also other things too. It has other opportunities for doing good based on how other people can be positively affected by the operation of the business. And so those are also going to be part of the, the company's existence. Um, just to give a little bit of my thinking and not, I don't want to get too much into this, like I just said, but another way you can think about it, uh, another option here that's on the table is a company could be seen kind of like the social contract theory as a, a social institution whose purpose and job it is to steward the economic facet of human life. So if I was a manager of a company, I could see it as kind of like, it's my job to be keeping an eye on how the economy, what the economic health is, and gauging that economic health in terms of how it's improving people's lives. It's kind of like imagining a business as like a little community. You've got the employees, you've got customers, you've got contractors, all this sort of stuff. And we're working together in this kind of organization for mutual benefit um, and not uh, asymmetrical benefit, right? Uh, not exploitive benefit, um, but uh, a, a kind of win-win scenario in which everyone gets to benefit, including people who may not be directly participating in the economic activities. But business people could see themselves as stewards of the economy in the same way that other professions are stewarding other resources, like um, doctors stewarding medical resources, or teachers stewarding knowledge, like the sum total of all of the wisdom and insight that humanity has been collecting over the centuries. Um, the teacher's job is to become enriched in that kind of wisdom, but then also to help other people get in on that, to make that available to other people. And in that way, they steward that knowledge. Um, there, that stewardship model, I think, is um, definitely um, a way to think about it. Kind of, it'd be like uh, the business being kind of like the social institution of the government, of something that Friedman thought was terrible, but could be another way to think about it. Um, like I said, all of his claims about the political stuff could definitely be challenged. There's other viewpoints on that. And the stewardship model might be one of those. That's just a quick sketch of it, and I could say more about it, but um, maybe that gives you some ideas. Um, I actually am, appreciate that you asked the question, Li Ling, because um, I think this kind of speaks to some stuff I was saying at the beginning of the lecture, too. It might be easy to just take for granted that there is no other purpose of companies. There wouldn't be any other possible business uh, purpose for companies because so much of our current culture and our current way of doing things in our society operates under that assumption. That like, of course, this is what it's for. What else could it be? Um, uh, one final note here before I leave. Uh, maybe I'm giving a long-winded answer to this question. But especially as we get into topics deeper in this quarter, um, especially when you get to the topic about social and economic justice, taking that wider view of like, why would capitalism be justified as a structure or model for how society should work? Um, what, how the rules and systems of society should happen. Why should it happen in the capitalist model? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the arguments in favor and the arguments opposed to that. Um, what would be the legitimacy of that? What would be the argument for that? 
sometimes thinking about it in that big picture way of like, you know, capitalism isn't the only option here, helps us to see what other possibilities there are for understanding um, the role that a company plays in a society and what its goals and ambitions and projects and purposes could be. Um, does that help, Liling? Cool. Awesome. You're very welcome. Thanks for asking questions. I, I love it. It always adds to the value and content of my lectures, um, like I've said before. So I appreciate that. Okay, so um, Boatwright's paper is entitled uh, What's So Special About Shareholders? And he's going to use shareholders or stockholders. It's basically the same thing. I'm going to probably stick to the language of stockholders, but when you see shareholders, it means the same thing. And he's really focusing on this defining attribute of stockholder theory. Oh, um, Liling's wondering how entrepreneurs balance uh, or sort of perform that balancing act between profit and morality. Yeah. How do you do that? How do they do that? Um, uh, well, we've got a few options, right? We've got uh, different models for how to think about that, and that's what these ethical theories are providing. Um, none of them are, uh, none of these theories are talking about a balancing act between morality and profit. Instead, they're looking at the moral basis of profit seeking. I mean, profit is a kind of value, right? We'd say it's good, it's a good thing. But on what basis does it have that value, and how does that value compare with other values that we care about? That's the right way, I think, to frame thinking about business ethics generally. And that was another thing I was kind of speaking about toward the beginning of the of this lecture when I was talking about practical arguments for um, an ethical theory or a policy or procedure or something like that. I, I think it's wrong to see there being this kind of moral realm and then an amoral realm, and it's sort of like a balancing act between the two. Like, I pay my taxes, I do, I perform my service to satisfy moral considerations, and then the rest of it I can do whatever I want with or something like that. Um, the fact remains that we think of profit as a value. It's a good alongside other goods. And the real question is, what is its value based on? And how is it contextualized with other values? And that's what every moral theory is trying to ask. So the question that you're asking, Leeling, is like the question of ethics, or especially if we're concerned about how, how does the moral value on profit fit with other moral values? Um, that's the question of business ethics in many ways. Um, the entire class will be exploring that question. So I, I'm sorry I don't have a quick answer for you, but there, the all the different perspectives we're going to be looking at are making different recommendations about how to balance um, considerations, the value that profit has with these other values that we care about, freedom, well-being, stuff in that territory. Um, there and, and the same thing was with the classical ethical theories that we talked about. Um, if, maybe if you recall, the classical theories don't really add any specific value to profit directly. Uh, even utilitarianism doesn't. Um, money is always seen as a mechanism for something else. It's a means for some other value. It doesn't have any intrinsic value. So we really have to think about the value of money in some other context, whether that's um, this kind of promise-making, promise-keeping of contracts that we've been hearing from Friedman and Hosnas, uh, or whether it's in terms of being able to like steward economic resources for people's well-being and their happiness and their quality of life, um, those are those are different ways to frame it. But money itself, profit itself, uh, has to receive its value from something that's not it. It always has to be contextualized by something else. Um, to say that its value is intrinsic is kind of like that absurd Scrooge McDuck kind of scenario that I talked about um, before I think probably with I probably first brought that up with Mill um, but yeah the buck doesn't stop with the buck <laughs> but, and that's even before we might be thinking with like really heavy morality kind of context I mean if we're just like it's just a value if we value it how do we value it we don't value it for itself we value it for the sake of other things okay let's let's get going here with Boatwright um, so Boatwright's challenging or targeting 
the definitive move of um, of uh, stockholder theory in saying that there's this exclusive duty that the manager has to the stockholders. So there's there's this fiduciary relationship, and what Boatwright wants to do is figure out what's the moral basis for that fiduciary duty that could possibly justify why that duty doesn't leave room for any other duties. That's that's the main question Boatwright has. And there's a few ways that the stockholder theorists can try to cash that out, how they can try to make a moral argument for that. And that's what the different sections of the paper are about. So maybe the morally relevant thing here is that the shareholders, the stockholders, are the owners of the company. And that's what makes the duty to them asymmetrically different than any other possible duty that the manager could have to other stakeholders or something like that. Um, Maybe it's because we the moral basis of this is something to do with the moral bindingness of contracts and the respect for freedom and autonomy that respecting contracts has. This is the big thing Hasnas was emphasizing. Maybe it's something about a fiduciary duty as an agency relationship, like being a surrogate for somebody else, a representative, like with power of attorney, that kind of thing. Um, like I talked about some biomedical ethics things or the example of um, babysitting my kid or, or borrowing my bike, that kind of level of the discussion that we've talked about before. These are all three proposals that um, Boatwright thinks ultimately failed to convince. They, the arguments are not capable of justifying that there is some special high priority uh, that the manager has with this duty to the stockholders versus to other possible duties that they have to other stakeholders. And then he's going to finally end with the suggestion that what provides the moral basis of the fiduciary duty to stockholders is actually a concern about public policy. Um, but at this point, when he's trying to defend um, uh, a duty managers have to stockholders as a matter of public policy, the game is basically up on treating that duty as something exclusive and um, all-consuming. Okay, so stockholder theory would be dead at that point. Um, this might be a good time for me to mention something I saw in the comments. I can't remember who said it in the discussion board, but I, I remember someone saying, why can't we get uh, stockholder theory and stakeholder theory to go together? They are mutually exclusive conceptually and logically. There's no way that they could both be true because of this feature that stockholder theory uh, has about positively excluding any other possible duties. If you're thinking of the duty to the stockholder as in the context of duty to other stakeholders, then you're operating stakeholder theory. Um, stakeholder theory does see the stockholders themselves as stakeholders. They are affected by the operation of the business, so what happens to them is something that the manager has to consider, but not exclusively. And that's more of what Boatwright's going to argue for, that there isn't this exclusive duty to the stockholders. Okay, so let's get into the first way the stockholder theorists could try to provide a moral basis for this exclusive fiduciary duty, and that's to see the shareholders, the stockholders as the owners. So um, he talks about like how things are have been in the past a certain way, and this is an important thing to keep in mind with a lot of Boatwright's arguments. He leans a lot on making observations about the way our world is today or the state of markets today and the circumstances that are taking place. A lot of the arguments are going to be if the stockholder theorists want to use this moral argument, if they want to use this moral principle, what are the conditions that principle requires? Look, those things aren't happening, so that principle doesn't apply. It's not to really be a wholesale con condemnation of the logic of stockholder theory, just to say that the things the stockholder theorists could say in defense of their theory are not things that actually um, the current circumstances fit the conditions for. It's not to say, it, th this isn't cutting against what I was saying at the beginning of the lecture tonight about the role of practical considerations. Um, even though Boatwright brings up things like legal precedent and what, what the state of the law is, he's not saying that the law determines what's morally right. He's not making that kind of argument. But instead, he, he uses the law, he uses other examples from uh, contemporary circumstances of, of our economy, of capitalism today, um, to just show that the moral principles that are being offered just don't connect. Not that we need to say, well, we aren't doing this, so it doesn't matter. Um, he's saying that these situations don't fit the requirements for the kind of moral appeal 
that the stockholder theorists could use if they're using one of these arguments or another. So in the case of this um, ownership argument, that maybe the reason why the stock uh, the stockholders re get this special respect from the manager is because they own the company, no one else does. All right? They are the owners. And so maybe if we imagine uh, a situation that could still maybe happen today, but is not very common, definitely doesn't happen with corporations. But let's say like um, uh, you want to, um, let's say you want to uh, run a taco cart or something, and uh, but you don't have the money to make it happen. And I'm a entrepreneur and I'm like, I got tons of capital. I'll buy your taco truck for you and then you can run this taco truck business and I'll get some of the profits. Um, but you can run it and it's your thing. Um, in that situation, I own it. I own the taco truck. And so my ownership, the fact that it's my property, um, allows or entitles me to kind of do what I want with it. So if I don't like how you're running the taco truck or something, I can fire you. Um, if you're not uh, running, like let's say, it'd be kind of like the way the stockholder theorist presents the situation, right? I can um, hire someone to run this company the way I want it run. So if I want your taco truck to be vegan and you start serving meat, I'm like, hey, this is my taco truck. You can't do that with my taco truck. And I might be in my rights to do that. But ownership is a little more complicated and messy in our situation now. So that's what Boatwright's saying. Things are different now. There's this distinction between ownership of personal assets and ownership of a corporation. These aren't the same thing Boatwright's going to say. And the evidence of this is that there's no longer control. So, for example, uh, going back to the taco truck thing, I own the taco truck, which gives me complete control over it. I've not signed those rights over to you or something like that. I can do what I want with my taco truck. If I want to be like, you know what, pack this thing up, I'm going to convert that taco truck into an RV and go on a like year-long vacation across the country. I can do that. It's my truck. I can do what I want with my truck. It's my private property. But if I buy stock in a company, I don't seem to have the same control. And how do we know this? Well, if you want to look at just how the business world works and supported by the legal system that speaks about these matters, um, shareholders, stockholders are not given the right to use corporate assets as if they were personal assets. I, if I buy a bunch of stock in Microsoft, I can't go down the highway here to the Microsoft office and say like, I'm gonna I'm gonna take that um that computer, you know I own hey I own this company. You can't object to me taking this laptop. I own this thing. That doesn't make sense. Even if I bought all of the stock, I'm not given that right. Um, and we'll see how Boatwright's gonna say there's a better description for what's going on here. But he, it might seem like he's splitting a hair here, but he, he, it's a, it's a hair that definitely has some pretty big consequences to it. Um, if there's a difference between owning stock and owning private property, that's a pretty big difference because of this right of control. So he says, because of this, because that is the situation that we're in right now, there are share, shareholder rights to try to protect their interests. And the point here is not so much like the law is dictating the reality, but it's evidence about what's going on. Um, if stockholders as owners of the company had control, they wouldn't need these legal protections to protect their interests, right? And what are those rights? A right to elect a board of director, uh, directors and a right to dividends from the company's profits. If I just owned everything at the taco truck, then all that money is mine. I do what I want. I decide to give you some of it as your like um, income or your salary or something like that. But the whole thing is mine. I wouldn't need any legal protections to make sure that I'm getting profit out of the taco truck. <clears throat> Not unless we started turning this small little business into something more like a corporation, right? And giving it that kind of legal status. Okay, now, Boatwright makes this argument. He says, if stockholders get these rights as owners, that that's as far as what their ownership means. They don't have, it doesn't extend as far as control, but it does give them this right to elect a board of directors and the right to dividends from company profits. 
That on its own does not logically entail or provide the adequate moral justification or basis for an exclusive fiduciary duty to the stockholders on the part of the manager. It says that doesn't logically follow. And I make a little I make a little commentary here on this argument. And this might also seem a little subtle, but I think it's important for emphasis. Um, to say that there's a logical gap here is a very weak claim. It doesn't take much to prove that, um, but we want to be careful about what is the weight that Hosna, or I'm sorry, the weight that Boatwright's objection to people like Friedman, how that works here. So I use another example. We could say there's a logical gap between having a right to life and it being wrong for me to kill you or for you to kill me, right? There is a logical gap there. We say people have a right to life, but you can kill people more morally in a morally justifiable way in self-defense. And if like if I'm coming at you with a knife, I'm trying to kill you or assault you, and you kill me in self-defense, well, I still have a right to life even though I'm doing this immoral act and this illegal act of assault, right? Um, but it's still morally right for you to kill me even though I had a right to life. So there's a gap there. One doesn't automatically mean the other. But we got to be careful about that. Uh, the fact that there's a logical gap doesn't in any way invalidate the meaning of having a right to life. It doesn't, I say, blunt the force that having a right to life is a pretty good reason for why it would be wrong for you for you to kill me or me to kill you or something like that, right? Um, having a right to life informs what behavior would be appropriate. So the fact that there's a gap, a logical gap between these rights and an exclusive fiduciary duty to stockholders um, doesn't mean that they might not be relevant in some way, just that it's not obvious. It doesn't follow necessarily. So I think the best way to put this is Boatwright's argument is that if the stockholder theorist wants to use these rights that, that stockholders legitimately have as a moral basis for an exclusive fiduciary duty to the stockholders, they got some explaining to do. They got to connect the dots on that. They got to show how are these things connected, okay? And Boatwright gives a possible answer. He's like, well, this might work. What about this equity argument? This is going to be a consequentialist kind of argument that basically um, we need to protect the risks of investors. When people invest in a company by buying stock, their money's at risk. They could lose it. There's a risk of harm here. That would be a bad consequence. There's something bad that could happen to stockholders. Um, someone might not want to invest their money in a company if they're just throwing their money away, right? That and that's a risk that can happen, right? Um, so um, there might be a need to do this by saying, "Okay, managers, you have a special responsibility to the stockholders, and we're putting that ethical burden on you the way stockholder theory is recommending." Because why? Because we need to protect the investment of the stockholders. We need to respect their investment in the company, and that's why. Okay? So notice now that's justified because you're kind of saying the stockholders are a vulnerable party. There's a bad thing that could happen to them. We don't want that to happen. Okay? So it's the concern about a negative consequence that might justify this moral policy. Um, and it's true. Shareholders, stockholders do not have contracts to protect their investments. They are vulnerable. It's not like when I buy stock from a company, if the company starts losing profits or losing money, hemorrhaging money, um, it's not like there's any agreement where they're going to pay me back or they owe me or something like that. No, my money is just lost. It's just lost. Right? It's like if you fund a Kickstarter and the people who ran the Kickstarter never pre create the thing that they promised uh, for their like rewards or something like that, then, I mean, you took a risk, you know, you tried to fund something and it didn't happen. That's what can happen. So they're vulnerable. And because of their lack of control, they have no way of withdrawing their contribution, um, directly. They can't take their assets back. I can't be like, okay, well, I bought this stock in Microsoft. Um, I'm kind of worried about where this is going. I'm worried about losing, um, my investment. So I'm going to just go over to Microsoft and take some of their computers to offset my risk, right? To try to reappropriate some of my assets. The situation isn't like that. There's, that's not allowable. That's not the rules for how this works. It's not the procedures and policies. Um, so this isn't a situation like my example here where 
I could like donate a table to the chess club and then take it back. Like if the chess club people stop coming to it and it dissolves, well, I'm not really at risk because I can just take my table back. You know, that's fine. Stockholders aren't in that situation. So they're vulnerable. That makes sense. Boatwright, though, doesn't buy this argument either. And here's why. He says, this doesn't give the grounds, this kind of consequentialist argument to prevent this bad harm from happening to the stockholders does not give justification for the conclusion that the manager's fiduciary duties are to the stockholders alone to have that as an exclusive duty. Here's a couple reasons why. One, perhaps existing shareholder rights do give enough protection to offset that, to ameliorate that risk, especially this thing about the right to elect a board of directors. That board of direct directors are going to have some kind of oversight and accountability for management and how the business is run. That might be enough to protect their investment. And But this is the much stronger argument, I think, the second point that he makes. He says, but there's, a, there's another mechanism that greatly compensates for investor risk, and that's the stock market. I like this quote. Indeed, uh, well, okay, let me actually, before I get to the quote, um, remember how we said earlier that they can't just withdraw the assets that they invested? You know what they can do? They can sell their stock and make money off of it and invest it someplace else if they want to. If they don't like how things are going, they can't go in and start taking the computers out of the offices. But what they can do is pull their stock out. Right? They can do that. Uh, that's totally possible. And I think this is a very, very good observation on Boatwright's part. Uh, indeed, managers and employees of firms generally have far more at stake in the success of the corporation than do the shareholders. Where's the logic of this coming from? It's coming from stakeholder theory. If the, and remember how I was saying in the Hosnos piece, I think the best justification for a stakeholder theorist would be on consequentialist grounds. So if we're concerned about those poor stockholders who are at risk with their investment, all this bad stuff could happen to them, well, man, if things go bad for the business, you know who's going to have even worse harm happen to them more than the stockholders? Managers and employees. Now, that's not always the true. He says generally, so that's fair. Um, if you throw your entire retirement savings into a single company and it goes bankrupt, then you're screwed. Um, but generally, that's not how it works. And um, uh, fund managers are usually, usually have a stock portfolio. It's diverse. You're not you're not putting all your eggs in one basket or something like that. And there's the ability to pull your money out if you, if it's looking bad. You can not lose everything, right? Um, once it starts going down, you'll be like, okay, getting out of here. <clears throat> I'm gonna do something different. But managers and employees don't have that same flexibility. Now, people can always quit their job and go try to find another job. But whether that's going to be a problem or not really depends on a lot of other circumstances. Um, how hard is it to get another job or a comparable job? Um, what is, uh, especially for a manager, if the company's starting to go bad and they're like, I'm out of here, the chances of getting hired in a similar job later are kind of poor, right? Um, they're definitely not going to look good on a resume. Um, so I think this is a fair point. And once we're thinking about consequences, it's a very natural thing to ask, okay, so why, yeah, why are the stockholders any in some special place? If we're just looking at consequences, it's not like the consequences that attach to them are monumentally greater than for these other interest groups, these other stakeholders. So that's where, that's where this argument's going. And then this is the thing I was promising earlier. Boatwright's sort of saying, you know, the better way to get a handle on what's going on here with seeing stockholders as owners is to say yeah they're owners but they're not owners of the company they're owners of the stock the stock is just one functional piece of a corporation it's not the whole thing it doesn't actually represent the business it just represents the sort of value that the business has on the market which can be traded it, it the stock market's actually really abstract it to to see it as um stocks as like these representations of actual holdings kind of starts to break down once you start seeing the modern stock market and the kinds of things that are getting traded like derivatives and uh, i used to know all these terms a lot better um when i was really doing i was doing all this research about the the um, recession and the housing collapse uh when the banks in 2008 um all the trading that was going on was getting out of control because it was like uh, people were creating financial products like derivatives that were like derivatives of derivatives um, and just selling risk 
like market risk was the economic product that was being bought and sold. That's really abstract, right? So I think maybe Boatwright's got some good footing here from for making this claim of saying this is the far better way to view the reality of what's going on. Shareholders own something, but what they own is the stock, and what they have control over is the stock, not the company. Um, so the argument is that the shareholder rights that are above exhaust the claims of ownership, because those are the only things that are related to being the owner of the stock, not seeing them as owners of the company, which means they don't have this special control or power or influence on the manager. Okay, the the manager is not beholden to them, because only in virtue of the stockholder's investment do I even have a job here or something like that. It's very different from that situation, the more microcosm situation of me buying the taco truck that then you run that business for me right that's that's very different okay that's the first argument that one took a little bit of time but the pattern that you saw there is going to emerge with some of these other ones so a lot of these ideas are going to be used uh, for the other arguments by boat right too any questions uh, from the chat how are things going no one's no one's interrupted me so far with any questions has it been going okay Cool. All right. I'll keep I'll keep trucking then. Okay, so the second option might be to see the relationship is grounded on the idea of a contract. And that was the big thing that Hasnas was emphasizing. Um, that there's some sort of agreement, contractual agreement between managers, CEOs, and um and the stockholders. So it's sort of like this. I agree to do this if you agree to do this. We'll give you the job and give you all this power as long as you use it this way. And who is the government or anyone else or the manager themselves to dissolve that agreement and violate the autonomy of the people involved who made this consensual transaction? That's the moral argument here. That's another moral argument that the stockholder theory could be that could use to try to justify the special status of a fiduciary duty to managers or of to stockholders alone by the managers. Um, the, the main problem here, oh, and by the way, this is different from the equity argument for obvious reasons. The equity argument was a, a consequentialist type of argument like utilitarianism. And, uh, this argument is a deontic argument. This is more like Kant, um, con, uh, the kind of moral obligations, these principled rules of promise making, promise keeping that are morally binding. Um, okay. So we're playing a different game here now. Uh, the first problem that um, Boatwright has with this is that there isn't a contract. These contracts do not exist. They never happen. Um, if there was a contract, then maybe there'd be a moral obligation of the manager to follow it. But there isn't a contract. There's definitely not an explicit contract. There's not this sort of signed agreement on, like, when the CEO gets hired that they're, like, pledging their loyalty to the stockholders and something like that. That doesn't happen. And there really isn't the basis for an implicit contract, too. And he and Boatwright's saying, at least not by nominal legal standards. And again, I don't think he's using the law as like the proof of this, because um, the law could be bogus, of course. But instead being like, hey, look at what the law is doing. I mean, even if that wasn't the law, what the law is sensitive to here, the conditions that they're setting up, probably are the right conditions for seeing this kind of moral relationship holding. If, if I was going to see myself as under a moral promise to you, um, if there's some promise making, promise keeping, there's some conditions that have to be satisfied to establish that, even if it's a sort of implicit sort of thing, right? Like um, if, oh, I don't know, would be a good example of implicit promise making, promise keeping. How about um, something as ordinary as this? Um, let's say I ask you if you, um, hey, you want to go see that movie on Saturday? And you're like, I don't think I'm doing anything. I'm like, cool, all right. And then we leave. I mean, that's enough of an interaction and based on the reactions and things that were said, it's kind of like there might be some basis here for seeing there being some kind of implicit promise making, promise keeping that's happening there. I mean, it's, it's pretty thin. But it might be enough. It might be enough. It's definitely different from an explicit promise where I'm like, I promise to see you at the movie theater on this day at this time. And you're like, I promise to do the same, shake hands, you know, something like that. Or I write it down. We don't do this, but, 
you know, something like that, some really explicit gesture. There's room for talking about contracts and binding contracts in an implicit way, but it, there's still some conditions for it to exist as an implicit thing. And the, the situation that is going on with stockholders and managers, Boatwright, again, is going to say it just doesn't fit those conditions for us to see that as the moral relationship that's taking place. Um, the first thing is that there just there isn't this room for interaction, right? There's no interaction between managers and share, and stockholders, or very very little, definitely not enough to make this sort of implicit thing going on. Stockholders buy usually from other stockholders. They don't buy from the company itself. They don't interact with the company itself. They go through some other thing like some stock trading company, or just talk to other owners of stock and agree to sell buy and sell them and that kind of thing. And even if they buy the original stock from the company, like the company is like, hey, we're opening ourselves up on the stock market. We've got all these shares available. Who wants them? And even when people buy them that way, um, there's an attitude, Boatwright says, that we have about this there, in terms of expectations. Sometimes social expectations can be leaned on as a way to ground an implicit contract. But Boatwright says that's not the attitude. No one has those kinds of expectations when we're engaging in these activities. It's stock is bought like a risk. There's no promises about it. They're not like, yeah, we promise you're going to get a return on this. That doesn't happen. Um, people might be like, hey, we signs are looking good, but there's no promises. Everyone knows when they buy stock, they're taking on a risk. Okay. And the fact that there's no interaction means there's no ability to negotiate the contract, even in an implicit way. Okay. Now there's another option here. As we know from social contract theory, that if we want to talk about contracts as a moral model or as a moral relationship, they don't have to be explicit or implicit. They could be quasi-contracts. And that was what a social contract was. Remember, social contract theory was saying not that, like let's say with the government thing, right? <clears throat> it's not like there's ever been an actual contract, an explicit or implicit contract between you and the United States government about the kind of terms of the agreement. That you're like, I agree. I'm going to obey the laws of the government, and the government says, we promise we're going to work towards your welfare and respect your rights uh, and the considerations of justice. And either side is like, uh, or, well, actually, it's kind of asymmetrical on a social contract theory, but it's like, if the government doesn't fulfill its end of the bargain, then the citizens don't have to fulfill their, their end of the bargain. No one actually made that contract, not directly, um, except I was saying for the, the exception case of uh, immigrants. Immigrants kind of have to go through a process sort of like that. There's a loyalty pledge and everything. Um, but people who are born into citizenship, they don't have that going on. Um, but that doesn't stop social contract theory from being compelling as a moral theory, because all social contract theory is saying is that you should act as if there was an agreement like that. And maybe that's what stockholder theory wants to say too. Okay, there's no real contract here, but the ethical thing to do would be to see the for the manager is the manager should act and make decisions in operating the business as if there had been a contract between them and the stockholders but there's a big problem with quasi contracts like we talked about with hasnas the metaphor of a contract does not provide any moral authority to the it's just a it's just a fantasy not to say not to use fantasy in a pejorative sense i kind of saw a couple comments i think on the discussion board about that. I mean, the fact that social contract theory is presenting an imaginary situation, act as if you had this contract, is not any blow to its credibility. It just means it needs to back itself up with a moral theory, the same as any of these other proposals. Okay, And Boatwright thinks that's going to be really hard to do. It's going to be really hard to say, you know, the moral situation requires acting as if there was this contract. Again, there's this attitude of stockholders being offered stock on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. Um, the re there's no interaction. While shareholders are beneficiaries of the kinds of obligations we think managers have, like things like no insider trading or no embezzling or something like that, just because the stockholders benefit from the fact that we consider those things unethical doesn't mean that we're considering those things for the sake of the stockholders, like the way stockholder theory sees it. Like stockholder theory says no embezzling because you're breaking your fiduciary duty to the stockholders when you do that. 
we could have other justifications for why embezzling is wrong without citing that we're doing it for the sake of the stockholders, that they have some special privilege moral status, like the whole the thing that Boatwright's been arguing for this whole time. Um, okay, and I, I think it can mostly, Boatwright's resistance here can mostly be summed up this way, and, th and this is a problem for this line of support for the stockholder theorist, that if you start taking the social contract route, then it's very likely that you will not be able to defend an exclusive duty of managers to, st to stockholders. Because most social contract theories, when they're offering their arguments about why this is justified, start looking at some system of cooperation by everyone in society. Um, I think I talked a little bit before about Rawls. I, I mentioned him here in my lecture notes, um, that veil of ignorance sort of thing, like where I don't know which person I am and I'm negotiating for the rules of society without having that knowledge. Like if, if I'm um, if, if I'm negotiating a social contract from that kind of position, why would I say that, yeah, the stockholders need to be given the only moral considerations here in decision making that the manager is is doing? That seems really implausible that's going to shake out that way. Now, it's not impossible. You might want to try to make an argument for that. Um, but there's a there again, there's a big burden of proof here that the stockholder theorist needs to defend. All right. One final option. Uh, chat, any any questions popping up on this second section here about um, the contract argument? So far, so good? Cool. I'm doing a good job explaining all this. Woo! Awesome. All right, we're almost there. Um, our video is now at, um, I've been lecturing for an hour and 45 minutes. I'm going to try to keep this not too far over two hours. I think, I think we'll be able to make it. We'll, I'll, I'll try to be efficient. All right. So the last option here is agency. So, and the, and the story is probably going to sound familiar. In order to see the moral relationship here as a moral relationship of agency or surrogacy, there are certain conditions that have to be met for a surrogate relationship to happen. The real life world of stock trading and management and corporations just doesn't fit the conditions, Boatwright's going to say. So uh, let's let's go back. I'll, I'll use the metaphor tonight of, um, or not the metaphor, but the illustration of um, a, uh, man, it's getting late, um, power of attorney, power of attorney. Um, I hope that's a familiar uh, phenomenon to you. Um, probably have heard about it before. Uh, a lot of stuff, I mean, it's going to be the same as like, a surrogate decision making for biomedical ethics so if you're not familiar with power of attorney you can think about it the same way but basically um, power of attorney in, empowers somebody else to basically act as your representative to the law uh, or like uh, legally as a representative say to the bank or something else like like if uh, you have my power of attorney if I sign my power of attorney over to you then you could like make decisions about, uh, you could be like negotiating with the bank about back payments on my mortgage or something like that. Like you can do things like that on my behalf. Things that normally you'd have to authorize um, if you wanted to change things with your bank, power of attorney can do on your behalf. Um, or if you're dealing with the government and the government is like, we need to be dealing with you, you know, you other people can't make decisions, they can't talk to the IRS about your situation with them unless they have your power of attorney, like a lawyer or something. Then they can do that. They can act on your behalf. But to get power of attorney relationships happening, they don't just come out of thin air. There's some things that are pretty important. Um, let's run down the, what those things are. And what we're at again is, is leaning on um, this uh, restatement of agency from the American Law Institute. Um, there's, there's some things that are interesting about this. Um, I think this source is a really good example of what I've been talking about, about Boatwright's relationship with legal considerations as a part of his arguments. He's not um, saying the law dictates the ethical or moral space here. He's saying we can get a guide to the moral space by looking at what people who have been thinking carefully about legal policy have sort of determined about what these phenomena are like. I mean, it's basically using legal sources as philosophical proposals. Um, and we can argue about them. We'd be like, we don't have to define it this way, but then there's a question why. And these conditions are not super controversial. I mean, they don't, they're not outlandish. 
Um, and the American Law Institute itself is not a, um, uh, a, they're not like the courts or something. They're not setting legal precedent. What they do is it's kind of a service to look at legal precedent, look at the laws that are on the books, and then offer definitions, offer sort of theoretical presentations for people to get a sense of what the shape of the law is. Like if you look at all these case studies, like what's the picture that's coming into focus, it's this. And sometimes um, these statements from the, the American Law Institute are cited in courts um, and treated with some authority, but they're not, they don't have the authority of like the United States government backing them up. This is a, just a kind of like service uh, to lubricate like legal matters um, and help inform and collate information and things like that. Um, but it's very well respected um, and like I said, it gets used a lot. Um, so here are the conditions that the American Law Institute offers as like, here's what it takes in, in order to become an empowered agent to act on someone else's behalf. And even if the law didn't look like this, this might make sense if we wanted to talk about this as just a moral model, a moral relationship. In order for um, someone to be your agent or to have your power of attorney, to use that illustration, there would have to be consent. Um, I can't want to be your power of attorney and then make myself so just because I want to. You have to agree to it. But also, if you want me to have your power of attorney, I need to agree to it. You can't just dictate that and it's going to happen. Um, this isn't like uh, a will, like when you die, here's where I want my money to go or something, or my assets or the house or the car or whatever. Um, you don't just get to unilaterally decide this stuff. Um, to, to have a transfer of this authority, there needs to be agreement from both sides. Okay, um, is that condition met in the case of stockholders and managers? Again, Boatwright's going to say no. There's no opportunity for this consent to be given. Just the same way that there was no opportunity for a contract to happen. There isn't this negotiating space for that to occur. Okay, so that condition is already not being satisfied. What's another one? Well, in order to have uh, this agency relationship, there has to be power for the putative agent to act on the other's behalf. So, in other words, it doesn't mean anything for me to have your power of attorney if my power of attorney doesn't authorize me to do anything. It doesn't give me any actual power. If you say, yeah, Tim, you're my power of attorney now, and I'm like, cool, awesome, I agree to that as well. And then I find out that whatever way in which you mean that doesn't allow me to negotiate with the the uh, b your bank on your behalf or um, negotiate with the government or represent you in court or anything like that, then it's like, then what are we talking about? Um, I think this is probably the weakest argument that Boatwright has in this section, but he says, um, he, he cites how managers are not given the power to redefine legal relations of the company with third parties like merging, changing bylaws, etc. Those require shareholder approval. So he's, he's sort of saying, there's certain powers um, over the company with, with that the manager is not given. So in that sense, they aren't a complete agent. They are not a complete surrogate to make decisions on behalf of the stockholders because that power hasn't been given to them. I think this is a little weak because um, there maybe are some ways in which someone can be empowered as an agent acting on your behalf in a narrower way. They don't need to be able to make any decisions, right? So if I'm like your power of attorney, that doesn't mean I get to go over to your house and decide what color drapes you're going to have. It's like that I don't have complete authority over your entire life just because I have your power of attorney. So maybe there's a response here that says, well, whatever power managers do have is sufficient to see the, them being able to act on the other's behalf. Maybe that's true. Maybe Boatwright's right that he, he, he says this, right? He's like, if they were going to be agents, in his opinion, he thinks they ought to have some of those powers, and they don't. So we'd have to we'd have to see some more argument about this. I think I, I think that's the safest way to read it. That in this paper, Boatwright hasn't done quite enough to shoulder his burden of proof when it comes to this condition. But this last condition, he's on much better footing. The element of control. So let's bring it back to the idea of power of attorney. Um, in order for you to be an agent of mine, for you to have power of attorney to act on my behalf, something like this, the only power I can give you, 
The only authority I can bestow on you is for things that I already own, right? So uh, because it's my right and my prerogative to, um, I'm the one who has control and access to my bank account, that's mine, that's something I can give away to you as my power of attorney because I already own it. But I can't give you someone, I can't give you control of someone else's bank account. It's not mine. I can't authorize you to have authority over something that I don't already have a right to. I can't give up anything that I don't have. And that's that's what uh, Boatwright's going to say is happening in this situation with stockholders and managers. That stockholders don't have the right to intervene on the way the company runs. They don't have that supreme authority. It's not like if I own the taco truck and you're running it for me that I can show up whenever I want and be like, I'm going to take this taco. And you're like, hey, you didn't pay for that. I'm like, it's my taco truck. Oh, nom, nom, nom. Or I'm like, hey, new policy. No more meat. I want this to be a vegan taco truck. And you're like, uh, I didn't want to do that. I'm like, my taco truck, my rules. And I'm like, that's more reasonable, right? But in the case of corporations, stockholders are not given that kind of right. They don't, they're not able to, remember before we said with the ownership argument, they can't use um, corporate assets as personal assets. They aren't given that right, okay? So the managers have independent authority and that is given legal precedent too. If you wanted more evidence that this is what's going on, well, that's explicitly in the law. This isn't just an informal cultural practice that no one does it because it's an expected norm. It's that that's actually represented legally too. So if the shareholders do not have any right to intervene on the company, then that's not something that they can bestow to the manager. Remember the whole premise of seeing an agency relationship here when the stockholder theorists like Friedman and Hosnos are talking about this. They're sort of saying like the the stockholders own the company, they have control over it, and there's sort of we imagine this fictional negotiation where they're like Okay, we're going to hire you, manager, to act as an agent on behalf of our interests. And what that means is we're going to give you control of the company. You can do what you will. You make choices about how company assets are used um, as long as you sort of play by our rules. But notice how that whole thing is premised on them having the control to give over to the manager. Boatwright's saying that's not the reality. That's not what's going on. So they can't give it away. They can't give away something they don't have. The manager is given this authority, they're given this power to make these decisions, not because of the special blessing of the stockholders or anything like that. So there's nothing special that they owe to the stockholders. It doesn't make any sense to see them as an agent operating on the stockholders' behalf. Okay, so <clears throat> there, um, yeah, we, we already kind of talked about this, so I don't want to kind of move things along a little bit here. So that's the argument about agency. Again, it's got this pattern of like um, boat rights being like, okay, cool, stockholder theory, you wanna, okay, so you gotta defend why, why should we think that there's this exclusive fiduciary duty to stockholders by managers and to no one else? Um, okay, you got some options here? Yeah, let me hear your stories. Okay, this, that, that, okay, that's an interesting proposal. You are speaking about a moral relationship that's real, right? Like ownership's a real thing, that has some moral consequences to it. Um, contracts are real things. Promise making, promise keeping, that's morally relevant. So are agency relationships. Those are all morally relevant things. You're appealing to some great moral values, stockholder theorists, but those values, those moral models don't actually fit the situation that you're trying to justify. So they don't work as arguments. It's like you're trying to defend uh, a conclusion with premises that are entirely irrelevant to that moral matter. That's really what Boatwright's argument is, that the argumentative attempts, the, the moral appeals that stockholder theorists might use to defend their position just don't actually fit the situation. They don't meet the conditions for that moral value or that moral model to be appropriately applied to that situation. We can't see it that way. We can't see managers as agents. We can't see them um, as in a contract. And we can't see the stockholders as owners of the company only as owners of the stock. That's how I could like sum up all these arguments in five seconds. Maybe you wished I did that instead of a two hour lecture. <laughs> um, but the details kind of matter here. Um, all right, so with 
the absence of justification for the fiduciary duty to stockholders, what do we, where do we go from here? And Boatwright makes an interesting turn here. <clears throat> he says, basically, I'm not going to say that there's no fiduciary duty to stockholders. Boatwright thinks there is. He thinks it makes sense that a manager should be thinking about the stockholders when making decisions about how to manage the business. He thinks that's right. And he's actually willing to entertain the idea that there should be a kind of single-minded focus on the part of the manager. But as a matter of policy, the manager should not be concerned with much else other than maximizing profits for the company. Boatwright does kind of go there. However, there's a couple points about this. One, he definitely thinks as a matter of morality that other stakeholders' interests morally matter. He does think that that's true. Um, how he's going to work that into a final vision here, well, he doesn't give all the full picture here. But what he, he, because this paper, Boatwright's paper here is really just focusing on analyzing this fiduciary duty to stockholders. That's his main fish he's trying to fry. Um, I know he does care about other stakeholder and other stakeholder interests, but he's going to say, what, what could justify the manager treating um, stockholders like why, why or, or let, let, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. What could justify um, managers being concerned with increasing profits that will then benefit the, the shareholders, the stockholders? I think that's probably a safer way for me to put it. Um, and he thinks there's a reason for this. I can think of an argument. Public policy. Now that we're thinking about just everyone as a potential stakeholder, everyone who's affected by the business has an interest in how the business is run, that could still maybe justify a policy that has managers being more concerned about just profit instead of doing all these social responsibilities. And the reason is this, and it might sound really familiar. I'm going to kind of summarize a bunch of this stuff here at the end. Um, that there's a concern that if you, kind of like Friedman had, if you have managers exerting all this social responsibility outside of the accountability that you get from the government, then you're making them into social engineers, and we might not want to do that. We might not want to give them that power. Um, by saying, by opening the doors to being like, well, you don't have an obligation to not do social responsibilities because of the fiduciary duty to stockholders. Boatwright's like, yeah, that doesn't make sense. Um, because of all the arguments he gave earlier, uh, he still thinks, you know, what does make sense is we probably don't want to have an oligarchy. We probably don't want to have our society being run by just the people who are in control of these corporations. That we don't want them to have, that that could uh, put the public interest at risk. And that's why he's saying as a matter of public policy, <clears throat> we should have managers just stick to profits, or pretty close to that. He says, the present state of corporate governance is not ideal, but it's a workable arrangement. And he thinks this is largely supported by contemporary law, um, that that's kind of what the law expects out of managers of businesses and corporations, that they're going to be working to profit, they're not being expected to do all the socially responsible crap, um, they're just focusing on that. Um, and I think this is kind of, uh, I think this is kind of interesting because here's a little hint about how other stakeholder interests could get worked into this. If Boatwright is saying having managers focus on profits is what's in the public interest because we don't want them to have this kind of power, um, that managers have this power to dictate even more of human life in society by giving them social responsibility mandates, um, that could break down really fast. As soon as that exclusive priority on profit is no longer in the public good, then a different policy would be justified instead. Because Boatwright has replaced the exclusive duty of managers to stockholders with a moral measuring stick, a moral standard that says, do what is in the public's interest. Whatever that is, that's what managers should do. And maybe the best way for managers to serve the public interest is by not pursuing the public interest. <laughs> That's his argument. But as soon as the circumstances are different, like any consequentialist argument, um, then that policy would no longer be appropriate. Maybe we would want to have managers exerting social responsibility 
if that would be the least bad option because of other issues that are happening. Okay, so <clears throat> imagine there was some like huge crisis in America, like something devastating, like I don't know, like um, like a big asteroid lands in the middle of the nation, and just things are just wrecked, um, or maybe um, environmental issues get so serious that uh, there's a huge water shortage. Um, or the seas start coming in and the ocean levels rising and all this kind of stuff, some stuff that we're anticipating happening scarily soon. Um, with those sorts of things, if the circumstances happen like that, maybe in those circumstances, I think that might be a clear case where Boatwright would be like, okay, profit maximizing, that is not the main ga game here now for these massive corporations that have so much power and influence for affecting stakeholders lives managers should maybe now really bond together rebuild society care for the people in this time of crisis and profits be damned like we've got to kind of refocus our efforts here okay and that's going to take organizational structure like corporate organization so um that that might be a different situation but um this I, i'll leave you on this note um, I think this is a sticky situation. I think we're kind of in a, a bind. So I'm going to – oh, I totally understand, Tanya, if you got to go to sleep. It's getting late for you because you're a couple hours back. Um, so that's totally okay. I'm almost done, and I will give out the code word, I promise. Um, in fact, uh, code word tonight's coconut. Coconut. It'll probably only be a couple minutes, Tanya, so you won't miss much. It's cool. Sleep tight. <clears throat> All right, so this is a little bit of framing from me, but I think we're in a sticky situation um, if we're looking at it from, like, the stakeholder perspective. On the one hand, if you have managers only concerned about profits, there's a lot of, like, negative things to the public interest that we can anticipate from that. There are, and we, uh, if you want me to get into a big argument about that, I, I could do that, try to present some evidence for why that's true. But we, we've got a lot of examples of this. Um, this isn't so outlandish to uh, imagine. A lot of the stuff that was going on with the housing collapse and the, the bank collapse uh, and the recession of 2008 is kind of um, unrestricted, unqualified, profit-maximizing run amok. I mean, that's what really happened. Um, there is this frenzy on um, derivatives trading that just went out of control. Um, because there was so much incentive of possible potential profit that everyone got on board on it and there was this massive bubble and it popped. Um, so those are, those are the public interest was harmed in that situation. Um, and we're slow, we've slowly, it's taken a while for us to recover. Detroit just this last month finally got out of the shadow of bankruptcy. Just now. That's a big deal. A whole city. Um, those are real problems. Those are real threats. On the other hand, if you give managers social responsibility and tell them they should be tracking those things and trying to do something about it, things can go south that way too. So it's a really tough kind of pick your poison sort of thing. Boatwright's like, right now, the poison I'm going to pick is like have managers not get into the business of social responsibility. But that would be, this is a bigger debate of like, I mean, if Boatwright's right, what he's basically been able to prove is just that the measuring stick for this is public policy of what's in the public interest considering all the stakeholders. Which policies are actually going to serve people the best is a deeper discussion, and that's going to have a lot of practical considerations to it. But at least we might have the, me the moral measuring stick for determining how to weigh all those practical considerations appropriately. Um, but that's a, it's kind of interesting, right, to find Boatwright um, sort of – like I summarized him a second ago, saying the thing that's in the public's interest is to have managers not concerned about the public interest. And that is not actually a contradictory position. Uh, to give you another example, there's a really famous um, 20th century utilitarian, um, R.M. Hare. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is Hare. R.M. Hare, who argues that um, because utilitarianism is the correct moral theory, people should not be utilitarians. He gives all these arguments for how if ordinary people are using the utilitarian theory as a way of making practical decisions, like using the utilitarian calculus and everything, you will not maximize utility. Um, Hare says that 
the uh, policy or the procedure that people should use for making decisions is to really follow morally absolute rules of justice, which is not what utilitarianism is doing, right? But on the grounds that following rules in that kind of no exceptions way is the best way to maximize utility. And, and that's perfectly logically consistent. This kind of position, there's room for this kind of thing in, in ethics. Um, there's a difference between what you're proposing and why you're justifying it. Those are not exactly the same. And the why can matter a lot in providing the meaning for the what, even when it appears like they're making the opposite contradictory sorts of claims. It's not actually logically incompatible. There's only room for that. And that's the kind of game that Boatwright's playing here. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll leave you with that. We're at two hours and ten minutes, so um, I'll call this video to a close. We got through just about everything uh, that I wanted to in my lecture notes here, so I'm very happy about that. Um, I hope this was uh, interesting and clear to you, and you've got a good idea for the fiduciary duty debate overall. That you can see a lot of the moving parts here, the things that are at issue, the concerns that people have, the possible values that are on the table, the different moral models that people are using. Um, and because this, like I said when I started this topic at the beginning of the week, this will be a topic that will have echoes throughout all the other topics that we're doing. Um, so if it's not making sense, if you've got some questions about it, if you're looking for some clarification, if you want to make sure or confirm you got the right handle on this stuff, please reach out to me, talk to me, ask me questions. Um, if I don't give you feedback on things like um, journals and stuff, like reach out to me. Please, please, please do that. I love talking with students, and I wish I was talking more with, these, with all the students in this class too. Um, especially if you're feeling confused or, or it's kind of like, phew, um, uh, I, I, I want to do anything in my power to help make it clear. I try to make my lectures as clear as possible, but, you know, I'm only human, and everyone comes from a different place, so I'm willing to talk to you and try to, to make it all work out. So, okay, I'll see you there. Good night, everyone, in the chat, and uh, good day to you on YouTube. I'll see you next time.